Shalom, brothers and sisters. This week's Thursday's thought, I was asked a very interesting question on Twitter the other day. And it's it's not an unusual question. It's not one I have been asked before. And I've probably talked about it indirectly or is a part of other topics. But I want to touch on it today now. And that is, why is it that if we are a prophetic people and always have been from the time of Adam until now, why is it that we don't know everything? And the example that this person gave was, how can we consider Joseph Smith to be a prophet if he didn't know that it was wrong to marry underage women? Now, I don't want to get into a discussion on whether or not he actually married anyone other than Emma or married anyone under the age of 18 or any of that. That's really irrelevant to the topic because the question is still valid, and I'm going to tell you why. I remember, and this is, this is my own personal experience. I was working at a, a small mom and pop bookstore called the Benedict Books, obviously catering to Latter day Saints, specifically the Salt Lake City Church. And people would come in and, and violently anti. When I say violently, I don't mean like physically, but they would come in and they would be very angry trying to discuss and, you know, pound on the Bible, you know, pound the book, so to speak, about why the Church of Jesus Christ, Latter day Saints, and Mormonism was wrong. And because it's, they didn't have anything new to say. It was really just me going over the same stuff that I had talked to people about back in all the way back in high school. So one day this guy comes in and he sees pictures of Jesus and he's like, oh, a Christian bookstore. And he walks around and he realizes that, no, this is not for Protestants. It's specifically for Latter-day Saints. And so he comes up to me and he says, is this a, is this a Mormon bookstore? And I said, it is. He's like, I didn't think there were enough of you. I was like, oh, yeah, there's several stakes in, in Ohio, you know. This area is the central Ohio stake. There's a lot of wards here. So, yeah, there's, there's a lot. Of, in fact, we're building a temple just down the road here. There's, there's that many of us. And he was really surprised. And he, he and I had a very, very genuine and a very good conversation. He would ask questions. Well, what about this? And what about this? And, and again, it wasn't anything new. And I, one point I told him, I was like, I don't mean to be rude. It's just these are the same questions everybody asks. And I feel like this, this anti-Mormon literature is what we call it, wasn't made to try to convince me that the church I belong to isn't true. Instead, it was made more to keep you from coming to check out what we're really doing. Now, that said, there are some things in it that are correct because there are some things that we're not Protestants that make us different from you. Having the Book of Mormon is obviously one of them. And so the conversation ended with, him asking me a question. He said, is there anything about this church that bothers you? And, and I, I thought about it for a minute. I, I, it was a really good conversation, and I didn't want to lie to him. I mean, I wasn't going to lie to him anyway, but I really wanted to genuinely ask the question, or answer the question because it had been such a good conversation. I, if someone's attacking me and they ask me something like that, I'll usually just kind of brush them off because, look, you're, you're not really interested in what I really think. You just want to prove yourself right. And maybe this guy did too. But at the end of the day, the way he presented himself was as a very loving Christian, and so I felt like as a fellow Christian, I, I deserved, he deserved a, a, a good answer, a solid answer. And the answer I gave was, after thinking for quite some time, if we are a church that's led by prophets, why are our parking lots always too small? And he rolled his eyes, and he said, well, it's good talking to you, and he walked out the door. And he didn't get it. He thought I was making fun of him. He thought I was giving him a sarcastic answer. But I was being very genuine. And this goes back to the question this other person asked on Twitter. If, the, if, if it's led by prophets, if Brigham Young had the prophetic knowledge, and, and I'm going to go with the Salt Lake City Church because that's the one I was raised in. If Brigham Young had the prophetic wisdom and knowledge to make sure to make Salt Lake City's roads big enough, you could turn a whole carriage around. So it was ready for modern roads with cars as it, as it was when it was time to, to modernize. The roads were the right size. Now, is that just Brigham Young's vanity of having large roads? Was he really a prophet? You know, th that's, that's up to the individual to decide. I know that there's ideas that he prophetically had empty spaces for elevators, but the reality was the elevators were a thing he was aware of. They probably just couldn't afford them at that time. So maybe it was prophetic, maybe it wasn't. But if it was prophetic, then why is it they couldn't make the parking lots big enough? Why couldn't they figure out that this one small ward was eventually going to house three, three wards? This one ward building was going to house three wards. And that center area, that center 
um, ward meeting where you're going to have cars left over from the first meeting, everybody from the second meeting, and cars coming from the third, people were going to park on the streets. And, and the big reason why I thought that was because at the time, I was part of a branch that was meeting in a ward building that had, or not actually right at that moment, but prior to that, at one point where I had to park so far away that after walking halfway there, I was like, you know what? I'm covered in sweat. I'm disgusting. I'm not clean enough to go to church. Cause that was something we were taught that you're supposed to be to clean when you go to church. So I walked back to my car and I went home and, and I wrestled with that. Why does, didn't the Lord know that we needed a bigger parking lot? The land was there because that, that particular building, that particular chapel became the, where, where the Ohio temple was built. And now the parking lot is definitely big enough. Now I, I want to sidebar for a second and say that later on I went to college and I, you know, I, I'm in marketing now. And so I, I do understand why the Salt Lake City Church makes their parking lots so small, why they have one building and overlap them. It isn't even the same. I mean, it might be the same money, but in my mind, it isn't. In my mind, you would get more people if you had more buildings. I, I think that it's very unwise of them to have people drive so far. Uh, it basically becomes gatekeeping to where people who are impoverished can't get to your church. But the biggest reason why is because when you drive past the parking lot, it always looks full. Like, wow, there's a lot of people there. This must be an awesome place. Look at all the people that are going there. When in reality, it's just a lot of cars because of the fact that you've got these large blocks of time where – you know, all these different churches are, are meeting. And I'm not sure how it works now because I know they've cut down their hours. But I do, I want to say that because for anyone watching the video, says, no, there's a reason behind that. Yes, I know that there is a reason behind that, but I didn't back then. And so this is something that I have given a lot of thought to. But I didn't think about it forever on this particular topic. The one thing that always bothered me from the time I was a child even even now it bothers me, is the racism that is slowly going away. Why, if Brigham Young was a prophet, why didn't he realize that he was following racist ideas? One of the excuses I've read for his ban on the priesthood is that it was a cultural thing. He didn't know any better. It was just how it was at that time. And if I were still a faithful member of their particular branch of the kingdom, I would say, well, then he isn't a true prophet. I would still wrestle with that because why didn't he know? And yes, I know that Joseph Smith originally didn't have a problem with slavery, but eventually the Lord taught him better. And he wasn't alive as long as Brigham Young. So there was, I'm sure that there was some cultural racism in the original church, but they ordained blacks. And so because of that, I'm going to pull it up here. When the reorganized church formed and they were trying to figure out what do we do here? We don't really have a revelation on this. Even though a lot of people in that particular branch of the kingdom were against it, Joseph Smith III had a revelation, and it said, Concerning the matter which you asked, it is my will that the gospel shall be preached to all nations and every land, and that men of every tongue shall minister before me. Therefore, it is expedient to me that you ordain priests unto me of every race who receive the teachings of my law and become heirs according to the promise. So unlike Brigham Young, Joseph Smith III, and I have talked about this before, actually went to the Lord to ask what to do about this particular cultural issue. Did Brigham Young? I, I don't know. We have no records on that. The Salt Lake City Church is very vocal about the fact that they don't know where the band came from. They don't know why that policy was created or why it even hung out for so long. But I want to point out that at the end of this revelation, and this, by the way, is in the Community of Christ or our LDS Doctrine and Covenants uh, 116, and in Doctrines of the Saints at section 5E. At the end, it says, Be not hasty in ordaining men of any race to offices in my church. Now, that doesn't specifically say blacks or Africans or like that. It says any race. For verily I say unto you, all are not acceptable unto me as servants. Nevertheless, I will that all may be saved, but every man, or I would say every one, in their own, in his, I would say their own order. And there are some who are chosen instruments to be ministers to their own. Be ye content. I, the Lord, have spoken it. Now, there are some members of that particular church who use this as an excuse to promote racism within that particular branch of our church. 
So I don't want you to think that they were perfect. They just, in my mind, were a little bit better at it because they actually went to the Lord for revelation. But being more democratic, every congregation was able to make their own uh, theologies, ideas, understandings, policies, procedures based on this revelation. And so because of that, there was some segregation in some places where there were, from what I understand, this is what I've been told by some people that are members of the community of Christ, there was some segregation in some areas. So we can't pretend like even in this, everything is perfect. But let's get back to the question. Why? Why didn't the Lord give a better revelation to make sure that that didn't happen? And no segregating awards, no, no congregations, no, none of this, no that. The Lord has to deal with us as finite beings. And I want to make this very, very clear. After Brigham Young died, I, I personally believe that many of the apostles in that church did not believe in the Adam-God theory. But it was taught as if it were gospel truth while Brigham Young was alive. And in fact, one of the Pratt brothers, I believe it was uh, Orson Pratt, was threatened with excommunication because he spoke out against it. But the moment that he died, they began changing their theology on the idea of God to move away from Brigham Young's teachings and back to what Joseph Smith taught. And I can't fault them with that. That First off, whatever you want to believe on God, that that's that's up to you. I believe that God wants you to build a relationship with him no matter who you think that he is. As long as you understand that the atonement is through Jesus Christ, as Christians, that's really the core thing in my mind that we need to be concerned about if we're going to be concerned about anything. But they didn't do that with the ban on blacks. Instead, we have quotes like George Albert Smith. Your ideas as we understand them appear to contemplate the intermarriage of the Negro and white races, a concept which has herefore told been most repugnant to the most normal-minded people from the ancient patriarchs until now. There is a growing tendency, particularly among some educators, as it manifests itself in this area, towards the breakdown of race barriers in the matters of intermarriage between whites and blacks. But it does not have the sanction of the church, this being Salt Lake City Church, and is contrary to church doctrine. And that is from a letter to a brother named Virgil A. Spanik, who uh, in May of 1847. And of course, anyone that has read Mormon Doctrine knows that there's, by Bruce R. McConkie, knows that in that particular sect, there's things against blacks in general and also against interracial marriages. Um, Spencer W. Kimball, he is the prophet president, or I would say apostle president, that at the time, in, in his tenure and in, in, in running that church, ended the ban on blacks in the priesthood. He said, we recommend that people marry those of the same racial background generally. And not only that, but I mean, let's, let's forget about race. He also says, and of somewhat the same economic and social and educational background. He does say that some of these are not absolutely necessary, but preferred. And he says, above all, the same religious background without question. In spite of the most fav favorable matings, the evil one still takes a moment monumental toll and is the cause of many broken homes and frustrated lives. So this is the guy who people always told me the famous quote I always heard was, as long as two people are righteous, they can stay married. As long as two, right, two righteous people get together, nothing will be able to separate them no matter what. And yet he's saying that race is going to tear, tear people apart. Economic status is going to tear people apart. So even he, the, the, the most progressive president of his time, <clears throat> was still not fully on board with this idea of equality. And of course, 
Boyd K. Packer, who was very famous for remarks against the LGBTQ community, said, uh, where is it here? Oh, okay, I apologize. I thought I had that quote ready. And I do not. And this is, I'm, I'm doing this with a one take, so I'm just going to paraphrase it. And if you'd like to look it up, you can. But he basically said that he encouraged Mexicans to marry Mexicans, et cetera, et cetera. So it wasn't just this idea of white people not wearing black people, marrying black people. He was listing out races and saying you should only marry people of your own race. I really wish I could find this here because I, I don't have time to edit this video today. Um, check real quick and search oh here he is I did find it I apologize for that little delay yeah in 1977 boy K Packer stated we've always counseled in the church being the Salt Lake City Church for Mexican mar members to marry Mexicans or Japanese members to marry Japanese are Caucasians to marry Caucasians, and et cetera, et cetera. And he claims that that council has been wise. So why is it, I, I, I know this is about race, and it, this isn't supposed to be about race, but I'm using this because it's just an easy one to grab at from my perspective, because racial problems were the biggest issue I had when I was a member of this church until I found out, you know, all their issues with the LGBTQ community, which in my mind, I can't see a difference between what they're doing now to the LGBTQ community and what they've done over time to the black community. Why is it that these prophets and apostles do not have the foresight to understand that change is going to come? Why is it that they hold on to the past and to cultural norms in regular society? These are social biases that have nothing to do with our religion. There is nothing in our scriptures, when translated correctly, that forbids interracial marriages, blacks of the priesthood, same-sex marriages, transgender individuals, or any of the things that we see many churches. Not, I don't want to pick on the Salt Lake City Church. Many churches are going against them. It's a huge cultural war, and there's been a big backlash against Christianity in general because it's like, you're supposed to have the love of Jesus Christ. When I read the New Testament, I see how he reached out to the marginalized. And you are just stomping in the marginalized, just like the Pharisees and Sadducees of his time. What makes you a Christian church when you're behaving just like these Pharisees and Sadducees? And I do want to point out that when the questions are raised, community of Christ went to the Lord again. Their president, Prophet President Steve Veazey and Grant McMurray, and both received revelations acknowledging the reality of equality among the Lord's children, regardless of, just as Joseph Smith III found out about race, gender identity and sexual identity. So we can't say that it's impossible to go to the Lord and get these informations because it isn't just me. I'm not the only one that's had these revelations. There's other prophets out there that have had the same revelations. So we have the multiple witnesses. And when you read the scriptures in the correct language, all the things it talks about against homosexuality in the in the Torah and the Old Testament is don't be a pedophile. That's what it really says if you actually translate it correctly. And you're not supposed to be a prostitute for any God, whether you're a male or a female. Even Paul in the New Testament, he's not talking about homosexuals. He's talking about the idea of dominating someone sexually as a sign of authority over them. So there's nothing in the scriptures that allows for this bias and this bigotry. So when people ask the question, why, why didn't the Lord know in the Old Testament times? I would say he is, number one, God is speaking to us where we are at every given time. There's rarely going to be a revelation in a book of scripture for something now that needs to be done right now because we're supposed to have living prophets at all times to handle what's going on right now. Two, when it comes to, let's go back to Joseph Smith, the original question. 
as human beings, we are going to be led astray. We're going to do bad things. So whether you believe that Joseph Smith was a polygamist or not, let's pretend for a moment like he was. He's going to make mistakes. He's going to have human desires and lusts. And being in a position of power, as much power as he had, it's going to be very easy to be corrupted. That's why we're supposed to follow Jesus Christ and not Joseph Smith. This is the church of Jesus Christ, not the church of Joseph Smith. We don't need to look at him for an example. We need to take the words the Lord gave him in righteousness, and we can look at his example in righteousness. But to pretend like he's an infallible being that isn't going to make mistakes, he wasn't a demigod. So we can't expect more from people than what they have to give. Now, if you were to tell me that Joseph Smith, part of the reason, you know, Sidney Rigdon believed that part of the reason why Joseph Smith was killed was because he was a polygamist. Now, I can't say for sure that that's true. But I will say that if, if, if the Lord told me that part of the reason was because he married underage girls, I, I wouldn't be too shocked. I would say, well, it looks like Rigdon was right. Look at King David in the Bible. I used this example in, in another video. He's still seen as one of the greatest kings, and he murdered a guy to cover up the affair he had with the man's wife. We cannot expect perfection from people, nor should we demand it. We should acknowledge things that people do that are wrong, and that they say that are wrong, and move away from that. So, number and then number three... When we were ready as a people to go to God and ask the question, we got the answer. Right now in the Salt Lake City Church, it's just like with blacks in the priesthood. From the beginning of the band, there were members of their church that were, you know, this isn't right. We disagree with this. Joseph Smith didn't do this. Why are we doing this? Just like there were women who said, hey, we had the priesthood. And Joseph Smith talked about this idea of us being deacons, teachers, and priestesses. Why is Brigham Young saying the Relief Society is just an organization and we have to have men in here when we didn't have that with the Nauvoo Relief Society? They chose not to listen to their people and go to the Lord and use the keys that they have to receive revelations for their, their body of Christ, their, their branch of the kingdom, their branch of the church. So in my mind, yeah, community of Christ is always going to be further ahead because they're willing to go to the Lord every time and ask. It's not hard. Joseph Smith III, Grant McMurray, Steve Easy, and all the ones between those two prove that. Every one of their prophets had a revelation. They were constantly expanding the, their doctrine and covenants. And yes, some of the revelations were just, we're calling so-and-so, but many of them have a lot of really good information, a lot of enlightenment and knowledge. So at the end of the day, the question that we should be asking isn't, why didn't the people way back thousands of years ago write a book that would be absolutely perfect for us right now? Nor should we ask, why is it that the people in the 1800s made mistakes, didn't follow God? I mean, the church broke up. It, it split it off into several factions because the saints were fairly leaderless. They, they weren't willing to unite in Christ. So when we ask these questions, why weren't they ready then? Why, why is it that they had to wait till they were ready later? It's very simple. We're not always, as human beings, willing to listen to the Lord. Do not put your faith in a church. Do not put your faith in me. Put your faith in God. When a leader says something, you have the, the spirit of prophecy and revelation. Go to the Lord and pray on it. Find out for yourself if it's true. And I'll tell you what, if they kick you out for following God, then you're in a better place. Because I'd, I'd rather be alone with the Lord than shove God to the side to be attached to a larger group of people. And I don't say that to spite anyone. I don't say that to be mean or cruel. I say that out of love. And because I believe that if we all had the relationship with the Lord as our primary goal in religion, 
then this brother wouldn't have to ask this question. We've got to stop focusing on trying to be right, right now, and begin focusing more on being righteous in humility by building a personal relationship with the Lord and inviting everyone else to do the same. And understanding that that is going to create diversity and allowing for this, these diverse ideas to flow into the church so that we can be one body and learn from each other in Christ. Now, I'm positive that this video is not going to answer everyone's questions or make everybody happy. I'm sure there's going to be a lot more that people are going to say after I, I present this. So if you have other thoughts that you'd like to share, I am always welcome to listen to them. And if they go beyond the scope of what I've talked about in this video, I'll be very happy to continue talking about this. But for now, this is my thought. We need unity and diversity, and we need to be a prophetic people so that we can know what God wants for us now and not worry as much about what God needed from people at another time. Because we are just as privy to revelation as they were. And our needs are the, not the same, but they will still be met. That's my thought, and I leave it with you in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen.